Well, my friends, in this video, I want to get started with chapter four on my uh, video book on my uh, chapters that I'm doing on my uh, life today after my near-death event that I experienced in 2002. In this video, my friends, we're going to be talking about uh, how my career for Cowboys for Christ proceeded and uh, how my marriage ended back then. My friends, we're going to get started in this video right after these messages. This video is sponsored by Heart to Heart Refinement Online School at Heart to Heart Refinement School Teachable.com. This guidebook is uh, stage three or course three for our online school. This is learning to bear the fruit of the Spirit. This is going to be part one, and we're going to learn about the character of Jesus Christ. We're going to learn about love, joy, peace, and patience. In this uh, course study, we're going to focus on six sessions. Session number one, we're going to uh, learn what the fruit of the Spirit is. In session two, we're going to learn to transform bitterness into love. In session three, we're going to learn to transform misery into joy. In session four, we're going to learn to transform worry into peace. And in session five, we're going to learn to transform frustration into patience. Well, my friends, I got about uh, five things on my list that I want to talk about in this video. I want to talk about uh, my life as a chaplain for Cowboys for Christ without any uh, experience in the ministry prior to that event. So what I want to talk about was what was going on in my personal life at that time. So number one, I want to talk about uh, the wife that I had was uh, very, very distant at that time. And remember that she asked me to move out because of the complications that I was having with a disability and how those uh, complications was affecting uh, our family. So basically, uh, she uh, wanted a divorce. She was very, very distant. And uh, why would uh, a wife that uh, married a godly man want to leave him after a disability, after a, a, a train accident that actually was not my fault? So uh, I pleaded with God for a second chance to restore my marriage. I pleaded uh, a while back uh, for a second chance to return to earth to help people. And I guess one of the things that was so severe or so significant in my life back then was there was two presents in the room where I was at. The presence of God, of course, was there, but the presence of my wife at the time was there too. This is something I'll never forget. And uh, having an outer body experience and entering into the presence of the living God, and at the same time, hoovering over my body and seeing the wife that I had at the time doing CPR on me. And I could see the uh, crease in her hair where she parted her hair over. I could see all that, but I could also hear and feel the urgency in her voice trying to bring me back to life. This is a significant part, uh, and this is something I'll never forget. And at the same time, she's growing distant on me and uh, basically getting back together with her ex-boyfriend. So one day I uh, decided I wanted to uh, humble myself in front of God and I, I kept trying to uh, reconcile my marriage. Everything that I thought I could make work wasn't working. And so uh, one night I fell to my knees crying where I was at and ask God to restore my marriage. And I promised God if he would do just one thing for me, and if he would grant that request, I would work for him for the rest of my life. How was I supposed to know what was gonna happen? My friends, you've gotta let the pride go in order to humble yourself for God to begin to work in your life. If I would not have humbled myself on on bending knee, sobbing, and just being at the end of myself, I don't think that request would have been uh, uh, answered. So I'm working on my uh, career as Cowboys for Christ, and for two weeks I didn't contact the ex-wife. I didn't reach out to her. Nothing happened. So two weeks after this prayer, um, the phone rang, and it was her calling me, and uh, wanted to know how come I wasn't contacting her every day like I used to. 
I told her I just felt that she was giving up and didn't want me anymore. And she says, well, I just uh, called you to tell you that I loved you, and I think it's time for you to come home. Wow, that was an answer prayer. Or was it? So I moved back home just before Thanksgiving of 2003. And here in a little bit, you're going to um, be watching a little video of a newsletter article that I wrote in November of 2004. Um, well, we'll get to that in here in a minute. But she asked me to move back home in, um, just before uh, the holidays of 2003. So I went back home and uh, moved out of my apartment, moved in with her, and uh, back in with the kids, in with the uh, issues that were still there. I was trying to change, but there was no change in the environment around me when I moved back home. So something was just not right. I felt uneasy about it. And so uh, one uh, evening I started looking through drawers and uh, I think it was God that was uh, projecting me to do that. And uh, I found in her side of the nightstand, on her side of the bed, was divorce papers that she had, uh, um, had wrote up and they were dated in September. This was the end of October when she uh, asked me to move back home. So uh, I confronted her about those papers that I seen and she said, well, I had changed my mind. Well, basically what she was telling me, my friends, is that she didn't change her mind. I think she has asked me to move back home because she wanted part of my settlement. Well, we're gonna, we're gonna talk about my settlement here after a while, but I want to talk about uh, the monthly newsletters that I did starting in 2004. So what I want to do, my friends, is I want to actually read those inserts to you. I want to explain those to you, and I'm going to explain those on camera. And uh, after I read each insert to you, I'm going to come back and talk to you because I think it's going to make more sense to you to know where my heart was at and where I was coming from. So what we're going to do is uh, we're going to look at some of those uh, newsletters and uh, I'm going to read them to you here on camera. So uh, bear with me as uh, we change the camera around and uh, I read those uh, newsletter articles to you. As you can see, this is the Christian Ranchman uh, newsletter published by Cowboys for Christ. You can see the date there is February 2004. This is a national newsletter that is uh, sent out uh, nationwide. And as a chaplain for Cowboys for Christ, uh, they uh, pick and choose which uh, chapter inserts they put in here. If you happen to get an insert into this situation, uh, it's a pretty cool thing. So, when I started for Cowboys for Christ, this was one of my main jobs. So, we're going to read an article, uh, actually um, four different articles in this uh, video. And what we're going to read is uh, inserts that I made. Again, it has to be outstanding in order to meet this uh, Christian Ranchman's published by Cowboys for Christ newsletter. And as you can tell, this is a volume 30, number one. By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if you love one another. And that comes out of John 13, verse 35. Now, in order to find my insert, we have to go and look and find out where it is. Okay, and as you can tell, there's a lot of uh, information in this newsletter. But we just got to keep looking until we can find the article that they published because I wrote the uh, article that was picked. And you can see all of those areas that have Cowboys for Christ uh, um, chapters in it. Okay, so we keep looking. And it would be nice if it was on the home page, but sometimes it don't get to the home page. So you got to keep looking for the ad. I'm just looking through here to find the ad of this newsletter. I'm going to 
pause until I find where it's at. Now, as you can tell, the uh, article that I wrote was uh, Thought to Ponder Devotional by Platte Valley Cowboys for Christ Chaplain Michael Nicodemus. So I'm actually going to read this to you, but you can see that it's written down there. It says, How do we allow Jesus Christ to shine in our hearts? This question is one that we have asked more than once in our lives. To people whom we hope know the answer, as we enter the holiday season, the question of the month is more quest than a question. The quest is one that we as Christians have to battle with every day. The quest is more than what Christ does for us, but what we do with Christ living in us. Look at Ephesians 5, 17 through 24. This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord, that you should not, no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk in the fertility of your mind, having their own understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God because of ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their hearts, who being past feeling have given themselves over to lewdness to work all uncleanness with greediness. But you have not so learned Christ, if indeed you have heard him and have been taught by him. As the truth is in Jesus that you put off concerning your formal conduct, the old man which grows corrupt according to the deceitful lusts, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that you put on the new man which was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. So according to God's word, it is not what we do with Christ, but what we allow Christ to do through us. Are we not supposed to die to ourselves and allow Christ to live through us? Next month, more on becoming a new man or woman through Christ Jesus, our Redeemer. Have a joyful holiday. God bless. Well, my friends, as you can uh, tell from that article that I wrote, uh, to get published in this uh, national uh, news article is a pretty big feat, and it's hard to do that. They have so many chapters uh, in the national organization, so the individual chapters is hard to uh, have just one person. So you have to be pretty good at what you're doing because... Uh, my boss, which was the president of this organization, um, sends in the devotion if he thinks it's good for this national newsletter. And so this one that I did in uh, February of 2004, the question was asked is how do we allow Jesus Christ to shine into our hearts? And I think for me personally, it was that quest to get Jesus Christ to shine through my heart, through the disability, through the injury, through the distant uh, ex-wife that I had at the time, and trying to figure out how I was supposed to live and let Jesus shine through my heart so other people can see that. So if, if my purpose was to bring glory and honor to God and help His people, that takes us into our next uh, newsletter article that's another national wide newsletter article so let's take a look at that one as we talk about honor and respect now as you can see this uh, article for Christian Ranchman published by Cowboys for Christ was uh, written and released on uh, May 2004 and in this uh newspaper we jump over to page 12 and as you can see on page 12 there is the uh, thoughts to ponder devotional by Michael Nicodemus I want to do a study on honor and respect in order to have a better understanding on the terms that I want to discuss I thought that I would refer to the dictionary for their definitions respect number one to feel or show honor or esteem or consider or treat one different with difference or courtesy. Number two, to show consideration for. Respectable, number one, worthy of respect or esteem, 
esteemable. Number two, having or appreciation to good social status, reputable, etc., decent, honor, proper. And then we see honor there, number one, have regard or great respect given, received, or enjoyed. And we see honorable, number one, worthy of being honored, specifically of or having a position of high ranking or worth, used as a title of courtesy for certain officials, noble illustrations of good repetition, respectable, having or showing a sense of right and wrong characterized by honesty and integrity upright. Following are a couple of Bible verses that I thought would tell us what God says about honor or respect. First, respect. It comes out of uh, 1 Timothy 3, 1 through 7. This is a uh, a faithful saying, if a man desires a position of a bishop, he desires a good work. A bishop must also be blameless, the husband of one wife, tempered, sober-minded, of good behavior, hospitable, able to teach, not given to wine, not violent, not greedy, of money, but gentle, not quarrelsome, not covetousness, one who rules his house well, having his children in submission with all reverence, for a man does not know how to rule his own house, how will he take care of the church of God? Not a novice, least being puffed up with pride, he falls into some condemnation as the devil. Moreover, he must have a good testimony among those who are outside, lest he fall into reproach and in the snare of the devil. Now what the Bible says about honor, Proverbs 3, 27-35. Do not withhold good from those to whom is due when it is the power of your hand to do so. When it is in the power of your hand to do so. Do not say to your neighbor, go and come back, and tomorrow I will give it to you when you have it with you. Do not dis devise evil against your neighbor, for he dwells by you for safety's sakes. Do not strive with a man without cause if he has done you no harm. Do no, uh, do not envy the oppressor and choose not of his ways, for the perverse person is the ab ab abomination to the Lord, but his secret counsel is with, is with the upright. The curse of the Lord is in the house of the wicked, but he blesses the home of the just. Surely he his, he scorns the scornful, but gives grace to the humble. The wise shall inherit glory, but some shall be the legacy of fools. Personally, after reviewing the definitions of the words and reviewing the Bible scriptures, I have reached a conclusion in my mind that honor is something that is given no matter what the return value is. The scriptures teaches us that we are to honor our parents, and I believe that would include all people in higher standard than ourselves, of which we include all elders. Respect, on the other hand, has a great deal to do with the other person, and that respect needs to be earned. I believe that most people are worthy of honor, but respect starts with a condition inside oneself. The first Bible scripture we must state, if a man desires the position, which to me simply states the position of the heart, or if you will, a condition of his heart. One is a position and one is a condition. In the definition of honor, you will see the words worthy of being honored and also highly regarded and highly respected, given, received. Also, you will notice that respect also means worthy of respect. So in conclusion, I feel that to be honored and respected are two very different things. Honor which is given and respect which is earned. If you would like further discussions on the subject of honor and respect, Please let me know. Yeah, my friends, uh, I wanted to do a study on honor and respect in order to have a better understanding on the terms that I want to discuss. I thought that I would refer to the dictionary for their uh, definitions. And as you have followed along as I read this article out of this uh, Next uh, insert, uh, this one was dated uh, May of 2004. 
my friends, there's a lot going on to get me up to May of 2004. So, honor and respect. What does it take to be a man of honor so that I can be respected? One of the things that made me uh, write that article is the guy that was my boss that was overseeing this organization was an officer in the army out of uh, Guernsey, Wyoming. That man had honor. That man was respectable. He was my boss. I was doing this for him to help his organization to be able to flourish in what he wanted it to be. Okay. So uh, I have two more uh, newsletter articles that we're going to talk about here in a minute. So uh, what we're going to do, my friends, is we're going to uh, check out another one that... Uh, was not really in a uh, the national newsletter. This uh, next uh, article that I'm going to be reading to you comes out of just the chapter newsletter that went out monthly. So uh, let's uh, listen to that and let's uh, read along uh, as I read that to you. Now you see here is the one that does not go out to the national association. It just goes out to the chapter of which I... Uh, was a chaplain of and you can see that this is a Platte Valley's uh, chapter Cowboys for Christ newsletter and this is volume 2 issue 6 and it was issued uh, on August 2004 and you can tell there's a lot of information in there so my uh, devotion that I have written actually starts on this page and it says thoughts to ponder a devotional by Michael Nicodemus let me introduce you to several kinds of people who express various forms of destructive criticism. First are the blamers. They avoid ex accepting responsibility for their actions by criticizing other people or blaming past experiences which cannot be changed or undone. Another negative cri critique is the hurtful joker. Humor is a positive method of relating to others, but hurtful jokers may make others to the butt of their humor. They specialize in laughing at people instead of laughing with them. A third kind of critique critic is the fault finder. This person seems to have an insatiable need to point out others' defects. Do you know what it what is so maddening about this person? He usually does does what he does with a smile saying I'm just trying to be helpful. Another kind of critique at large in today's world is the cannibal. These people don't criticize in a joking matter or settle for mere nitpicking. They go for the juggler. They attract through the most they attack through the most severe forms of personal criticism and put down with complete disregard for the feelings of others. Destruct, destructive criticism may say they are only interested in remodeling you into a better person by sh sharing a little constructive criticism. In reality, these critics are intent on putting you down, tearing you down, punishing you, and manipulating you. Their brand of criticism does not nourish, it poisons. When you are the target of another person's destructive criticism, the natural response is to become defensive. In reality, at least, in reality, the least effective way to respond to criticism is to defend yourself, make excuses, or counterattack. Rem remind yourself to answer to God and to yourself, not the critical person. Being responsible to God, you look to Him for direction and approval. Being responsible to yourself, you take ownership of your feelings, attitudes, and behaviors. If you are aligned with God and with what He wants you to be, you don't need to fear criticism to try to justify your position. You have the power to make your own choices and grow through the experience of criticism. A non-defensive person, as a non-defensive person, you respond and feel good about yourself. You believe in your worth and your capabilities. You possess your own identity and sense of security. 
being non-defensive, you can listen to others more objectively and evaluate better what they are saying, even when they express themselves in a negative manner. You can accept his or her right to see the world as he or she sees it, whether or not it coincides with your views. You're able to relate to him or her without making despairing, despairing comments or negative judgments against him or her. What is your first response to criticism? You are thin-skinned, touchy, or sensitive. Ask God to help you listen with interest. Take the criticism, evaluate it, and apply what will be helpful. Well, in that article, my friends, uh, I talked about critical people. I talked about people that criticize other people. What inspired me to write that article was uh, what the ex-wife was doing to me at the time. And uh, as you can tell, that newsletter uh, was dated uh, August of 2004. Well, things started going downhill really bad uh, around that time. So I want to go back uh, after I read some of these inserts. I got one more insert that I want to do uh, for 2004, but uh, I want to talk about the things that was going on in my home life on top of trying to be a chaplain for Cowboys for Christ. One of the other things that I was doing on the same pattern for Cowboys for Christ is I would go to people's houses and I would visit with them and if they had an, a function going on, I would go and I would be the chaplain of that group. If there was a death uh, in the organization, I would go to that. If they needed me in any way, I would go to that. Uh, we got into doing uh, uh, Cowboys um, for Christ uh, Rodeo Church. So I got the opportunity to speak in front of uh, a bunch of cowboys and people that came to um, a rodeo church. That was uh, very enlightening. But at the same time, uh, I'm dealing with a lot of issues. So, so where I'm at now is uh, I read the monthly newsletters um, that I that I um, discussed there for a minute. And so now I want to talk about what uh, went on. So you know that my wife uh, really didn't want me to move back home because she loved me. She wanted me to move back home because of uh, the money that she thought she was going to get from the settlement that I had against the railroad. And she thought that that would be beneficial on her behalf to help me living at home when we fought the railroad on this case. Well, she asked me to move back out on March of 2004. At the time, I'm doing my uh, um, duties for Cowboys for Christ as their chaplain. Well, I didn't want to move out. I didn't want a divorce. I was being a man of God. I was trying to be honorable. I was trying to be respectable, okay? But uh, things just didn't work out that way, my friends. And... Uh, so I stayed until June of 2004 with a criticism and the conflicts that she was bringing my way. We didn't go to settlement for the railroad until October of 2004. So uh, I moved into uh, a new apartment in June of 2004 and I filed for a divorce. She didn't want to be the one filing for a divorce because she thought if she filed for a divorce, remember, she already had a divorce paper already wrote out, and she thought it would hurt her chances for taking half of my settlement. Yes, my friend, she wanted half of my settlement. We were only married for a year before the accident happened. Half of my settlement for the rest of my life. So, uh... I'm going to talk about the battle for the railroad for a minute, and then I'm going to share the last uh, newsletter insert that I did. Okay, so uh, settling with uh, the lawsuit against the railroad, uh, we had a big battle going on, and uh, I was severely injured, still am to this day from this. The railroad was uh, in neglect of having a defective locomotive on the line as a leader that should not have been there. It was in the paperwork prior to us taking that train that they had a defective leader not to use it as a leader. It was our leader and it wasn't supposed to be. So 
my broken neck happened because of their negligence. So I had hired an attorney and he thought my case was worth $14 million. Yeah, $14 million. When we went to mediation, he asked for the $14 million. The railroad came back and offered $25,000. We sat there for eight hours, my friends. And then he came back with a, a $6 million. My attorney came back with a $6 million proposal of a settlement. And the railroad came back with a counter offer of $75,000 to settle the case. Well, they were trying to just wear me down and wear me down and wear me down. And uh, I wasn't going to take uh, $75,000 for an injury that uh, left me with all the complications. My friends, if you want to know what the complications were, just go back and watch my videos uh, from uh, um, the introduction and uh, you're going to know what they are. So as time went on in this uh, settlement, uh, I'm going to let you know that I went to mediation by myself. I had my attorney there and his helper and the railroad people was in another room, okay? And we had a person that was the liaison that was working between my room and we were suing the railroad and the railroad per person I was in another room. So back and forth, back and forth. So they thought, well, we'll just make this guy wait. And I was about ready to just call it quits and take this thing to jury trial. So uh, they came back with a uh, $100,000 uh, settlement and my attorney went back with a $4 million settlement. Still, we're not reaching any kind of a negotiation. And so my attorney and his helper comes to me and they says, didn't a while back if you said you could get a couple hundred thousand dollars and a monthly payment coming in that you would settle this case? And I says, yeah, but they're not nowhere near a couple hundred thousand. And uh, I had attorney fees that I had to pay and I had the loans that I took out to just to live from this, from this injury and I have to deal with that. And at the same time, I had some debts that my ex-wife expected me to pay off. I was struggling, my friends. What am I going to do? So eight hours into the mediation, they finally came up with $400,000 for a settlement. My attorney says to me, he says, well, we can take this to jury trial and we can try to get a couple million dollars out of it. But what happens when we try to do that, he says, is the railroad's going to appeal it and you're not going to get any money. This is going to take two, four years down the road by the time any mediation comes. You might get two or three million dollars from a jury, but you might not get anything. So it was a gamble on my side in order to, to get that $400,000. So that's what we settled for is $400,000. That seems like a lot of money, but my friends, by the time the attorney takes his money and I pay back all the bills that I have to pay back that I took out for the two years that it took me to settle the case, I wound up with $175,000 in my pocket. Not enough, not enough, my friends, not enough. Still isn't enough to this day. So my friends, I wanna to talk to you about uh, the last newsletter that I wrote. Uh, um, in 2004 for Cowboys for Christ. It was uh, November 2004. I'm going to go ahead and uh, stop um, and let you uh, listen to that uh, um, article that I wrote and then I'm going to come back and I'm going to talk to you about it. I'll be back in just a few minutes. My last devotional for this year uh, of November 2004 comes out of Volume 2, Issue 9. And uh, as you can tell, there's your main part of the body. My devotional falls uh, over here on this page. And it says, uh, um, Human Interest Story. Thoughts to Ponder Devotional by Cowboys for Christ, Michael Nicodemus. It has been two months since I sent in a devotional newsletter. I have been busy building a new home north of Scottsville, Nebraska. I feel that we need to a place to meet this side of Torrington, Wyoming, so I wanted to host a meeting or two out at my new diggings. If the weather holds, I would like to be 
I should be able to move in about Christmas time, at which time I would like to have you all out at the for a housewarming party. I hope you will come and see what God has been doing with this old cowboy and the life in which he has chosen for me to live. I want to share a few things that have been going on in my life the last couple of months and maybe you will understand what I have not why I have not sent a devotion for a few months. I want to talk about divorce and God's biblical reasons for a man of God would want a divorce as a reason to end a relationship. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. A big scripture to live by as a man of God. If I can't lead my household in in the ways of God, or if the people in my household have hardened their hearts against God, this is a reason for divorce. 1 Corinthians 7, 12-15 states, If any brother has a wife who does not believe and she is willing to live with him, let him not divorce her. And a woman who has a husband who does not believe, if he is willing to live with her, let her not divorce him. For the unbelieving husband is sanctified by the woman, and the unbelieving wife is sanctified by the husband. Otherwise your children would be unclean, but now they are holy. But if the unbeliever departs, let them depart. A brother or sister is not under bondage in such cases, but God has called us to peace. I am sorry that I must tell you as your chaplain that my wife has asked me to leave and has asked me for a divorce. I could sit here for hours and tell you what went wrong with this, but the bottom line is what the scripture teaches us. There are so many scriptures to help us make decisions in our life, but as always, divorce is the hardest to make. All I know is that I love God with all my heart and long to do His will in my life. I guess when God deems the marriage as dead, he will and does give an inner peace as the direction one must take. God has given me that peace, and you know what? It's going to be okay. And it says it continues over on the other page. I long to, as always, be your chaplain and guide you through my devotions of the ways that God has called me to live. As a man of God, I pray that you will understand and continue to allow me to share God with you in this manner. So I will close this devotional letter and leave you with all with one last thought. Life sometimes can deal from the bottom of the deck or it will pass you by in a fleeting light. So please, my friends, take some time for Jesus and you will never have a cold, dark night. Well, my friends, as you... Uh read in that uh, uh, human interest story with me it was a devotion to ponder divorce and uh, I talked about uh, why I had to go through it and uh, what it meant and the hardship that it uh, had on me it was hard to be a chaplain for a full year and think about uh, getting a divorce but I had no choice she uh, was an unbeliever. She wanted me to leave. I didn't want to leave. So what were we going to do? So uh, I left and I filed for a divorce because she just wasn't wanting to have a life with a chaplain. She wasn't wanting to have a life with the disabilities that was left behind. My friends, things heal over time. But when somebody hardens their heart towards God, and hardens their heart towards you like she did towards me. We have to live with that. We have to figure out how do we move on and deal with that. So as you uh, heard me talk about in that article, my friends, I actually had uh, built a, uh, a ranch house that I actually got a piece of property from uh, the settlement to build a home on it. In the next uh, video, my friends, we're going to talk about the One Heart Ranch Ministries. It was the property that uh, God had asked me to do for Him. We're going to talk about that in chapter 5, my friends. Until then, my friends, I hope that you got some uh, um, benefit from this video. I hope that you got to Um, get to know my heart a little bit and who I am from the the 
struggles that I went through. My friends, things are going to start to look up in the next videos. I want to talk about molding, the molding process. When God begins to shape us and mold us to be used by Him. It's a lot, my friends. And I'm reminded of the armor of God. The armor of God is like putting something on. But my friends, we have to know how to put that armor of God on, okay? That's a mold, okay? So when we're molded and shaped, we're putting something around our heart, around our mind, around our body to protect us. That's being molded. That's being prepared to be filled and equipped for the battle that we have to go through each and every day, my friends. So my friends, be encouraged when you deal with the storms of your life. We're going to come back and I'm going to talk about the ministry ranch that God asked me to open up. In the meantime, my friends, may God bless you. May his face shine upon you and may Jesus always bring you joy. I'll see you in the next video.